Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. What's up? What's down? What's going on around? This is Startup Taiwan Foreigners Business Guide. I'm Paolo Li Sing, founder at MillionDC.com. This YouTube channel and podcast are offshoot of my book, Startup Taiwan Foreigners Business Guide, published in Q4 last year. This channel will find answers to your questions about starting a business in Taiwan. So leave those questions in the comments section below. Enough about me. Let's talk about our guest, Elias Ek from Sweden. Elias is CEO and founder of Inspire Inc. It's a B2B telemarketing company helping the world's largest companies find and communicate with their Taiwanese business customers. Inspire also provides phone answering services for small and medium-sized companies. Elias is frequent guest lecturer at Taiwanese schools and universities and is honored to be called up by the government departments and politicians to give his inputs on laws and policies that affects the lives of foreign residents in general, but most specifically for foreign entrepreneurs. Elias is famous for his book, How to Start a Business in Taiwan, that has helped thousands of foreigners go through the step-by-step -step details of setting a business here in Taiwan, from registration, taxes, even auxiliary service such as rent. With his goal of providing further support to foreign entrepreneurs in Taiwan, Elias also became or turned himself into an angel investor. He started Dragon's Chamber startup pitch competition with a goal of finding and funding the next big startup in Taiwan. Elias, welcome to the show. Uh, before we start, let's ha we need to clear some rumors. Is it true that you're actually mad at me for writing a book <laughs> that has the same target audience as yours, which is how to start a business in Taiwan? No. How fantastic is it that there is now two books that is trying to help the community that I have worked for for so long. It's fantastic. Good job. Thank you. And I was, I was quite um, happy to know that before the book came out uh, to the to know to the bookstores, uh, I got your message saying congratulations for the book. I was actually super happy on that day that I received your sort of like blessing for me to release that book because when I um, when I wrote that book and announced it to the public before it's published, people were already asking me how is it different from uh, this book, and people were already kind of mad at me that you know you have a strong following that's what I was saying so yeah now that it's out of the out of the question we can now proceed with this interview so first question uh, what's your Taiwan connection what made you come to Taiwan so I'm from Sweden mm -hmm. I moved to the US to study I went from the US to Japan as an exchange student loved it there thought I was gonna you know stay in Japan but I had to go back to the U.S. to finish my degree. And my first week back in the U.S., I met a Taiwanese girl. Oh. So okay. instead of ending up in Japan, I ended up in Taiwan. I see. So how long was this? Is this like... That's 21 years ago. So you've been here I'm practically... Yeah, 21 years. I've lived longer in Taiwan than I ever did in Sweden. Okay. So I'm also interested about your company. Before we jump into the actual book that you've written, um, what is Inspire? What is what is it trying to do? I hope we gave a, like a good introduction earlier, but for the sake of our audience, could you tell us more about it? Yeah. So for the last 19 years, um, Inspire has been building uh, towards now we're probably the largest B2B marketing company in Taiwan. So we work for mainly large IT companies like Oracle and, and you know this kind of big IT, foreign, foreign IT companies, and we help them to find business customers in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So we have a telemarketing department. We make about 5,000 phone calls every day on behalf of our customers. And um, we also do customer service. So we answer phone calls and web chats and so on for hundreds and hundreds of customers. Um, and then we have a digital marketing department. So we do search engine optimization and so on. For, and that we do for a very uh, select number of customers. Uh, that's a new um, group for us. So we do mainly Taiwanese manufacturers mm -hmm. that just hands over their whole marketing to us and lets us run with it. Wow. Um, 
So my next question is actually have been answered. It means that you've started Inspire before starting the book, right? Oh yeah, a long uh, time ago. I mean, basically I wrote the book because when I started Inspire, actually Inspire was the second company I started in Taiwan. I started another business before that year, two, when I, okay. So I came to Taiwan in year 2000. Okay. In my third week in Taiwan, um, we started working on our first business which was a supposed to be a laundromat. Okay. Yeah, there were three in the whole Taipei, New Taipei area uh, at the time. Anyway, we didn't do the laundromat because we couldn't figure out where to get $3 million that we needed. So instead we started a web business, ran that for about a year and a half, sold that, oh, wow. ended up with some money and thought to ourselves, what are we gonna do? And the previous business, the web business, could have needed a company that we could outsource customer service to, but we couldn't find one. So with money in our pocket, uh, we decided to start um, Inspire that first provided phone, uh, phone answering services and then later grew into other companies. Anyway, when I set these companies up, at the time there was absolutely no startup community. Okay. And there wasn't, I had no idea where I could go for advice. I made every possible mistake. Um, so in 2005, when we've been up and running for a while, I organized an event, uh, which I think was the very, very first event for foreign entrepreneurs in Taiwan. Um, we thought we were going to have maybe 20, 30 people. We ended up having 127 people wow. that showed up. Um, and you know, since then I've organized many, many events for foreign entrepreneurs. And in 2010, I was on my way home to Sweden and I was stopping by in the airport in Bangkok and I walked into one of the bookstores there and there was a whole bookshelf with just how to start a business in Thailand, right? <laughs> okay. And I'm thinking, <laughs> holy moly, I keep on answering the same questions over and over again. We should need a book. Why doesn't we have a book? you know, to answer questions. So I came back to Taiwan and said, okay, I need to work on this. And it, yeah, it, honestly, it took me two years from having the idea to we came out with the book. It's a lot of effort. I, I've read the book and uh, as we've discussed, uh, you know, before this interview is that the main difference is that your book has a lot more details into it, like right. the tax prices, the rent, uh, the rent rates and everything that uh, like a foreign entrepreneur would need to know uh, just so if he needs to estimate the, the actual cost of running a business in Taiwan. Right. Whereas my book has uh, some more stories into it that at least gives a person uh, at least like like some sort of like an opinion on the, what, what's going on in Taiwan. So I could imagine that yours took a lot longer. In terms of pages, yours is like 300 plus, mine is around uh, 200. Uh, my question is, um, you've been here in Taiwan for like 20 years. Has there been any major changes since the time you came here up to right now, 2021? Oh, huge. Um, so if I go back, let's say 10 years, right? 10 years ago, uh, I uh, co-organized the very first startup weekend in Taiwan. There was, this was like the first, uh, maybe one of the absolute first like startup community events that, that was organized here. And because I just came out with a book, we did the startup weekend. So I ended up ha having a chance to start meeting with uh, government officials, you know, people from the, you know, Minister of Economic Affairs and stuff like that. And back then, whenever I introduced myself and my company, they would say, oh, so you're a foreign, gong, foreign company. And I said, why is Shangong? So it's like, no, we're not a foreign company. I'm from Sweden, but my company is registered here in Taipei. Yes, 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 a foreign company. No, 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 you're, we're not a foreign company. We're a Taiwanese company. We'd, a owner who is from Sweden, but I live here. Yeah, a foreign company. By the time, we, we could go round and round and round like that. <laughs> and back then, you know, when I spoke to these people in, in government and so on, they, they couldn't get their head around the fact that a foreigner could own a Taiwanese company, even though it was legal and all, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
but conceptually they just wouldn't get it. Um, because at the time, even though there were a few, you know, there was actually quite a few foreigners that ran companies, but um, you know, they were all, there wasn't a community, they weren't very visual, right? Correct. And the Taiwan government at the time had not yet figured out that they wanted more foreigners to come here to start businesses. Um, so, I mean, that's a big difference. Okay, so uh, is there anything that's very significantly different from before compared to today? For example, when you were trying to register your business, how was it? So, I mean, I, I think in that area, actually, things haven't changed so much, right? I mean, you think about, okay, so when I first started my business, the biggest legal difference is that uh, uh, back in the day, you had to have uh, a minimum amount of paid in capital, right? You had to have, I forget what it was now, a million dollars um, or whatever. Now you don't, right? If you, if you don't need an ARC from your business, you can start a company here with 50,000 or 100,000 NT, right? right? Which is a, a, a big, big difference. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, the biggest differences or the biggest challenges for a foreigner in Taiwan is seldom the laws. The laws are quite often quite open. I think the challenges that foreigners are facing here are much more in terms of attitude. I mean, I take, for example, um, a foreigner is to try to walk into a Taiwanese bank. Mm -hmm. You know, you're getting that, <gasps> wow, you know, a foreigner, right? You try to apply for a credit card, you try to apply for a, a bank loan, or even to set up a bank account. Let's face it, Taiwanese banks hate foreigners. We don't need to, you know, <laughs> try to smooth that, right? Um, so, and that's the case even though there is no law today that makes it uh, hard for a foreigner to have a credit card. That's all on the banks. Correct. Um, in fact, um, for, my, for my personal uh, bank account, I tried to open a bank account, uh, you know, closer to my area because I moved, moved houses and I thought maybe I should also change my, you know, ch open a bank account closer to where I live. Right. And they actually denied me right. from opening a bank account. And this is, this is my first time that to hear that a bank account can actually, a, a bank could actually deny you from opening like a, a bank an account, right? when it's actually a business for them. It's, right. it's like, okay, it's like taking your money and making it safe in our deposits. Right. It, it, so that has actually gotten worse, right? <laughs> you know, Mega Bank got fined a whole lot of money, what is it, three or four years ago uh, by the U.S. government for uh, uh, allowing money laundering. And, you know, based on that, the government instituted some new requirements on the banks to be vigilant of money laundering. And the banks reacted by, you know, really clamping down on it, right? So, I mean, these days, uh, you know, the people that buy my book and they come to me and they ask for advice, their number one problem is to actually us being able to set up a bank account for their, their new business. And again, there is nothing in the law that stipulates that you can't. It's just that they are being extremely conservative. But so far, I think that every, we've been able to, you know, by, by taking them by the hand, walking them into a branch, and you know, finding somebody who's willing to listen, and we explain to them what this company is doing, and you know, please consider their actual situation, right? Because the problem with banks here is that when they see a foreigner, whether that person arrived yesterday or has been here for two decades, one person has a, you know, a, a, a student visa maybe, and another one has an APRC. The bank just sees them as a foreigner, right? Correct. And what I've been trying for a very long time is to tell the bank, you need to actually do your homework to actually look at their credit situation, right? You need to, you can't reject them because they're a foreigner. That would Correct. be the definition of racism, right? Correct. You need to actually ask them for their financial situation and so on, right? Correct. Um, what also surprises me is the fact that um, for Taiwan, it's a very, it's a developed country, and for you to be unable to receive payments from, let's say, PayPal to another PayPal mm. within Taiwan, a lot of people are having problems with that. Right. So, 
and also uh, the fact that um, only one bank is actually allowed to accept these kinds of transactions. Uh, the ESON bank is the one wherein you could actually you know, like receive money from PayPal and withdraw it from your ESON bank. Right. I, I'm not sure. They, some of, like ESON claims that, at least the person I talked to, that other banks are also capable of doing this. Because when I approached them, when I was opening my bank account, I told them that one of my main problems uh, is that I am unable to, you know, encash the PayPal, uh, you know, remittances that were given to me or paid to me that to a bank account. And they say, and they told me, oh, you can actually open it to any bank. Mm. And I was like, no, no, it's only as far as I know, that's not true. That it is literally. The, the government made a deal with PayPal that they can operate only within these parameters and somehow they picked or chose or randomly decided, I don't know how, that it's only Eason Bank. Correct. Yeah. And it's, a, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the pain points, especially if, uh, if, if you want faster transaction, if, if you're requesting people to do things for you, like mm. from overseas or, uh, and PayPal is the only way for, for many people right. to do uh, payments. Um, how is it different? Uh, how is Taiwan different from the Sweden uh, startup ecosystem? So, first of all, when I grew up, right, I, when I tried to start my very first business back in Sweden when I was still a teenager, um, the attitude towards, you know, what I was trying to do was like, what the heck are you doing? You want to be a capitalist, <laughs> you know? Um, but these days, I mean, if you're looking at the last five, six years, to my great delight and some, some surprise, Sweden has now started to rank very high in terms of countries that are, are uh, friendly to startups. Um, and it's also interesting, you know, Sweden has somewhat famously taken in a whole lot of people from other countries. Like since I left Sweden, Sweden ha Swedish population has increased, so now 20% of the population are either first or second generation immigrants. Okay. Right? Um, and it's interesting, I've read so many stories of so many great immigrants that have come to Sweden and they have started big, big businesses. Okay. Um, I think they are actually, you know, even more somehow able to grow bigger and more successful than in Taiwan, perhaps. And I think a big part of that is access to capital. I mean, it's still okay. so hard for people to raise seed money in Taiwan. Uh, you know, and that's true for, you know, you know, Taiwanese people as well. But for foreigners, it really is so much harder to find that first couple of million dollars that you need. Correct. Um, if you rate Taiwan on a scale of one to ten, uh, and compared to Sweden, let's say Sweden is now number 10, uh, is, has a score of 10. Mm. Well, how far is Taiwan? Ooh, that's a oh, tough sorry, question to answer. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, where are we? Are we like seven, eight, maybe? Um, I mean, in my opinion, if, if a foreigner wants to set up a business here, and again, I, I you know, I work pretty much only with foreigners to, when it comes to the startup part. You can get your company set up and running. You can do business here, no problem. You know, and once your business is set up and running, I feel like the government is very seldom up in your business, right? You pay your taxes, everything is, is good. But where things get complicated, like I said, is when it comes to fundraising. And you think about so many Taiwanese companies that are raising bigger money that money is nearly always coming from outside of the country mm. and you know in many cases they end up incorporating in other countries too you know like somehow we're we're not even retaining the successful ones as taiwan based you know correct um yeah so apart from the the, the financial situation i think this is uh, it, based on my, you know, like small research, this uh, this banking system, payment system, goes a long way because of you know Taiwan's position. I think this is the this is one of the only countries that is separated from the in, the world's integrated banking system. For example, HSBC in 
in in the UK could just wire it directly to HSBC in Hong Kong but right. I'm not sure of whether that is like a straight as straight line as transferring it to an HSBC in Taiwan apart from from this kind of problem do you think there are still some things where in the government could step in and improve the ecosystem I mean, ecosystem, if you're talking about community and all of that stuff, of course they can do more. But, but again, in most cases, we're not talking about legal issues, mm. right? We're talking about, you know, what can the government do to make bankers look at foreigners as a viable market, right? Um, or, okay. It takes three months to set up a business, two, you know, yes. something like that, two to three months, right? Correct. Now, for most companies, if you are setting up your own business here and, you know, you're going to do something small, that's okay, right? Because you're not going to have many surprises. It's, you know, you, you get on the train and it takes you two, three months to get your business started and it's okay. But if you're throwing in the, let's say, the fact that you're going to try to get a, an investment in, right? Correct. And you know you have a, a high growth company, so you want to get that money in as fast as possible. And then you have that foreign investment commission approval in there. Suddenly, you're ending up with a whole lot of chicken and an egg situations, which in many cases drives people to incorporate, let's say, in Singapore instead, where it takes two days to set up a business, correct, as opposed to two months, right? Yes. So you set up the company in Singapore, and within days they can transfer that investment in and now you can start doing that business. Correct. Right? So, uh, why does it have to take so much time? I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And the president has already made some announcements or back, I think if I'm not mistaken, back in January saying that she will try to help ease the financial system in Taiwan so that more businesses could thrive in. And I guess this is also as a result of some clamors from uh, foreigners um, and also as part of their uh, ways to increase the foreign uh, direct investments coming to Taiwan. But until now, it hasn't materialized. Where are we now? We're in uh, April and so far we haven't heard any um, solid steps apart from that top line um, pronouncements from from the president. Um, you yourself have turned yourself into an angel investor, and I and I'm sure it's coming from it's rooting from the fact that you further you want to help, you know, startups here thrive, spe specifically for foreigners. Could you explain more about it? What are you looking for in terms of projects, and what made you? Uh, go in this direction? Well, if you may, let me tell you about an event I've been organizing for the last few years. It's mm -hmm. called Dragon's Chamber. Yes. Um, so five years ago, um, a friend of mine who at the time was very uh, active in the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, John Kellenberger, he came to me and he said, you know, have you seen that TV show, The Shark Tank? Okay. Um, and I said, of course, of course. And he says, yeah, we need an event like that. I said, okay, let's do it. Um, so we decided, we came up with Dragon's Chamber, Shark Tank, Dragon's Den. It became, you know, Dragon's Chamber as in Chamber of Commerce. Um, and for the last five years, we, we have been running this event as a pitch event specifically for foreign entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. right? So we're looking at any type of industry. Okay. Why? Because there are already other events that are more like tech oriented, right? Correct. And we only look at like really early stage. So people that That's need really a few million NT, because if somebody is further down the road than that and they need bigger money, I think in Taiwan they're already now, you know, there are other places you can go if you, you know, there are later stage investments, right? Correct. But if you want that first two, three, four million NT, if you don't have it, it's really hard to get, right? Correct. So, so we organize this Dragon's Chamber event um, and uh, we take in uh, people, you know, we open up, people come and apply and we help them um, through a process where we help them to improve their pitch and also their business model. Okay. Um, and then in November during the Meet Taipei 
uh, event, mm -hmm. you know, which is organized by Business Next Media and, and so on. Um, they are so nice that they are giving us uh, space. They sponsor us with the, with the stage uh, space during Me Taipei. Mm -hmm. And we have five teams that get to go up and pitch in front of a panel of dragons. So that would be, you know, either um, angel investors or VCs or very experienced entrepreneurs, right? Um, and the goal of this event is very clear. I want to enable foreign entrepreneurs to, to get the seed money that they need. Okay. Um, now, when we were organizing it last year, when it's the fifth year, I noticed that honestly, uh, not as many teams as I wanted has received investors, uh, investments. And another one is that I really would like to see more foreigners investing in foreigners. Okay. Right? With the risk of this becoming a very long show, let me ask you this. Take a guess of how, no, 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 no. in Los Angeles, mm. there are 7,000 independent donut shops. 7,000 independent donut shops. Okay. Now, if I would ask you out of those 7,000, how many of those 7,000 are owned by a Cambodian person? You would say, Wow, that's a trick. Is that a trick question? I, because my answer is almost 90%. Really? I, okay. I think so. You think so? 90% of the donut shops in Los Angeles are owned by a Cambodian person. Somebody who for, came from Cambodia. And you say 90%. I, 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 maybe, yeah. Okay, sure. you're saying 90%. Okay, you're ruining my story here. But oh, yes. it's okay. <laughs> 5,000 out of 7,000 donut shops in Los Angeles are owned by a Cambodian person. Why? Okay. Because there was this one dude who came from Cambodia, um, I think late 70s, and he learned how to make donuts and he set up his own donut shop, became successful doing that. And then, you know, some cousin or something came, came over again, you know, and he helped them to set up a donut shop. And then some other person from in the Cambodian community said, this looks like a good way to make money. So they helped him set up a donut shop and you know, it grew and it grew and it grew. Anyway, I'm, I'm using this as an example of a immigrant community investing in the immigrant community. Oh, okay. Right? Yes. And you know, in other countries you can see this a lot. I mean, also like in the US, a lot of um, you know, nail salons are owned by Vietnamese people, for example, Correct. or whatever. It's in like, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yes, I understand to some extent it becomes a stereotype, but it's also because they use their internal networks, pooling money together, helping people to invest, they earn a little bit of money, then they reinvest in, in their communities. But we don't see that very much in the foreign community in Taiwan. Is it because um, for the cases of, let's say, the Cambodian donut shops, um, they know Cambodians, basically, whereas in Taiwan, you're talking about a large population of foreigners from different countries. So right now, Taiwan is around 800,000 foreigners. And of, of that, a huge chunk is for Indonesians, followed by Philippines. Mm. Um, and then, you know, like people who actually have money are actually smaller community within this whole 800,000. And then there's this, you know, like, I don't know you, you're, you're a foreigner, maybe I wouldn't invest in you. Mm. Yeah, is it no, a but, you, no, of but that? I, of course you're you're absolutely right that there is something in in how the communities are organized mm. that are standing in the way for people to to start pooling money together and whatnot. Um, and I mean, and this I think also, you know, what you know, for example, you and Andrew Clark and so on are doing in in starting to really build more of the communities. I think will hopefully help, right? Um, so I'm not the only one doing this. We are, you know, all of us who are like deciding to go out and, and step up and organizing events or doing, you know, podcasts or whatever. I think we are doing our part in letting this foreigner know that he's not alone. And, you know, if he can give advice to or ask questions from this guy and whatnot. And I hope what's going to happen is that 
we're gonna get past the oh I just need some advice to oh you know you need a million dollars well I have two hundred you know can my mates come in and we'll we'll we'll, we'll pitch you know in. get it together right okay and we need to start seeing that more and more I like that you are trying to make this more as like a foreigners community instead of a specific nationality community within Taiwan because um, but it takes a lot of like you know like like effort to yeah. make everyone be comfortable that hey we're all in this as opposed to oh this is just for the Swedish uh, people in in Taiwan or right. this is just for the Filipino community no but I mean I would say well yeah, there's uh, there's probably a heck of a lot more Filipinos here than there are Swedes. But yes. I mean, <laughs> no, I, I don't see this as a as a anything for any specific uh, group of people. I'm saying that we are all of us who are immigrants into this country. And the funny thing is, we very seldom use that word, do we? We, yes. we talk about ourselves as foreigners here. Yes. Right. And I honestly think that we should start using the word immigrant much more often. I think it's because of the fact that Taiwan has not relaxed the rules in getting a passport. No, no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> that's, that's why like, I always just call myself, oh, I'm a foreigner in Taiwan. But actually, if, if Taiwan only relaxes that rules, the, the, uh, the rules around getting a passport, I guess many, many foreigners would like to access that because um, they, this is basically, in your case, your, your home, right? right. Uh, same with me. I've been here for 11 years and I'm just waiting for Taiwan to relax the rules so that you, can, you'll, you will just skip that step of relinquishing your first passport and then applying for a Taiwan passport. Right. And many are trying to say that, but it's still not being maybe it's heard but maybe it's not yet time for them to take action on it I I think that the 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 fact that it's so hard for an immigrant to actually become a Taiwanese citizen <clears throat> I think that has much more repercussions than we think for example there's a lot of foreigners that have lived here for decades that don't speak Chinese very well mm. now why is that well, of course, you can talk about any one person as being maybe lazy with their, <laughs> with their Chinese class or whatever. But I think it is very much so that because there is so few people that end up becoming citizens, that it, it creates much more of this otherness, okay. right? So, I mean, I give an example. A few years ago, I, I, I was having a meeting with a um, bank branch manager. Okay. Uh, then we were having a, a conversation about the, the challenges, the stuff that we've just talked about. And he was telling me, well, yes, of course, because you're a foreigner, so I cannot get the credit report on you. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. that's not correct. He says, yeah, of course, you're a foreigner, so, so I cannot get the Taiwanese credit report on you. I said, that is incorrect. Let me prove it to you. So I went down to the credit bureau, took me 20 minutes, I paid 150 NT and I get my credit report and I went right back to the bank branch and I'm, here's my credit report. <laughs> but okay. he was so sure that because I'm a foreigner, the regular system doesn't work, right? Okay. And he was so sure that he wouldn't check, right? Okay. And, and I mean, that's in so many cases, this complete assumption of otherness, okay. right? Another example, for 10 years now, or more than 10 years, we've been suffering through the problem with the ARC numbers, right? Where Correct. the ARC number system is different from the Taiwan ID card numbers. Yes. Why is it like that? I sat at a, a, a dinner many years ago, right next to a person um, from Minister of Interior, who had been on the work group that came up with the new ARC numbers at the time and I told her about these problems, and she had never thought about it. She mm. said straight up, well, you're a foreigner, so the numbers should be different, oh right? It, okay. it wasn't that, oh, they, they need to be different because something. No, it was just locals, foreigners, not the same, therefore needs to be different, right? And, and I think, yeah, so, I'm rambling here, but I think no, the good. issue with 
the, the citizenship has repercussions in the whole attitude of both communities kind of developing and not really overlapping enough and, and so on. And I think uh, if, for example, uh, for many people, um, like the foreigners, if they know uh, for a fact that their eventual plan is to stay in Taiwan as you know having two passports I think they will do much more effort into you know like living here like studying the language right. making sure their businesses are are up and running in, in a nice way as opposed to making just for like five living here for just five years because eventually maybe I'm gonna move somewhere right. else because maybe it's not maybe I, I'm gonna be tired of waiting for that law that will Right. change how you apply for passports. I mean, so. how many people have you heard that said, oh, I came here, I was, th I was thinking about staying, staying for one year, and you know, now I've been here for 10 or 11 or whatever, right? A lot, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so people, e even when they fall in love with this country, there is still that little bit of feeling of transience that you know, maybe one day I will have to leave, right? Maybe when my kids are old enough that you know, they will meet some issues here. Or maybe when my parents are old enough that I need to take care of them, I need Correct. to leave because I can't bring them here, Correct. right? I mean, under current laws, you know, um, you, know you, you could bring them here for maybe a year, but that's it, right? Actually, you can. Uh, if you enlist them as your dependent, they can actually get an ARC as your dependent, but they're not supposed to work because, and this is for the case of parents who are senior citizens, like 65 years and older. You can actually uh, bring them to Taiwan. But, but yeah, you also mentioned about the, the fact that, um, you know, you can't really plug yourself in Taiwan because you always think that somewhere along the line you will just leave Taiwan, so you couldn't really make um, good plans. And I think that, yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit more subconscious than it is at the front, right? It's, I mean, at least that, that would be my, my explanation for why we meet so many um, foreigners, immigrants that speaks such bad Chinese. <laughs> you know, a couple of years ago, I, I, I went back to school and I started studying Chinese again. And one of the reasons was because I started hearing uh, TV shows from Sweden where people had come from refugee, as refugees from, you know, Syria, for example, that lived in Sweden for like two, three years, and they were already speaking Swedish, you know, better than, you know, I speak Chinese after 20 years. And I'm like, wow, you know, but you know, because they just apply themselves, right? And well, so why are we seeing all these foreigners that haven't done that here? I think, again, I think it's about a, a, an otherness. Plus the reality that, you know, like, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some posts on social media in which if, <coughs> if the government comes up with a press release saying, oh, we've, we've granted a Taiwan passport to a, a certain person, and then people are just going to start like bashing it saying oh you've actually waited for like 20 years before granting a super old person right. his passport so does that mean we need to wait this long i yeah. need to be 80 years old before you give me my passport as yeah. opposed to <laughs> i'm in my prime the prime of my life and i can do more as a taiwanese citizen <laughs> yeah i mean the government hasn't helped their own case by like you're saying um, it seems like at least 90% of the people that were, you know, there's that loophole, right, where if you're applying under certain circumstances, you can become Taiwanese without having to give up your original passport. And, you know, it just seems like 90% of the people that have been approved for that are, you know, nuns and priests that have been selflessly taking care of, mm. you know, orphans for 60 years, right? And they are now in an age where they probably will never have any kids. For example, in your case, I think you qualify for, for getting a Taiwan passport already, considering that you have done a lot of things for Taiwan. You've established companies, you've helped the startup um, community in Taiwan, at least the foreign community. Um, well, I promised myself that sometime this year I will at least apply, and then we'll see what the government thinks about that. But the <laughs> thing is, the government themselves um, 
should be able to pinpoint who are the who p which of these people are contributing worthy of getting that uh, Taiwan passport and hopefully we could have someone from the government um, call me in a good way <laughs> <laughs> to explain things and you know give us good news that hey we are relaxing the rules hopefully we, we will have that in the you know in a few couple of episodes from today uh, that, that right. there is some some good news yeah. I want to pull it quickly to the fact that you are an angel investor. Are you particularly looking for any specific industry projects that, so that when, whenever there's a foreigner who may need some funding? Uh, so if I'm, uh, I'm looking for things where I can contribute more than money, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, where is my expertise? My expertise in, is mostly in B2B. Okay. Um, so, you know, can I can I contribute my connections? Can I contribute uh, my knowledge about how to um, you know build up a business and so on? So, if somebody just needs money, um, yeah, then that's probably not for me. Um, in industries, no, I I can get excited for just about any type of industry. Um, you know, but of course, if, if it's more than just the money making, if you're also helping other people while making money, that would be nice, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, we're, uh, you know, I just today gave an offer for, for an investment uh, to a, <laughs> a, a, a group of students that are hoping to solve the problem of the 3.4 billion kilos of food that Taiwan throws away every year. Wow. Um, so they are trying to connect um, bakeries first. They're starting with bakeries. Okay. Um, and they're trying to first connect them with people who are willing to come in a very uh, annoying late hours to pick up bread that otherwise would go into the garbage. And they're going to try to use that money to build up an organization that they can then help connect food banks and homeless people wow. with, you know, where is all the food, right? Okay. Because Taiwan is certainly not lacking food, Correct. but we have all this food that's being thrown away all the day. And then you have the uh, people who are going hungry. And of course, this is not just a case in Taiwan, it's everywhere. But the first step is to be able to build a sustainable organization that can start mapping out and understanding where all these resources are. Um, so yeah, that was one example of a company that I, I got quite excited about. Because I'm I quite excited for that as well. Just as when you're talking, I just realized that you actually walk like just a few meters and you see one bakery and then another bakery within Taiwan, in Taiwan streets. Right. And it's also uh, common that businesses in Taiwan, at least for these kinds of bakeries, they, they just pop in, pop out. And I guess it's because of high rents or whatever, like they cannot really make a good turnover. Right. So I guess that business is, hopefully they could flourish in Taiwan and hopefully it's gonna be a big business for them, for the students. Well, yeah, so I mean, we were talking to, to one um, bakery up in, in Tianmu. And you know, this guy runs like four locations. And he's saying, you know, whether you walk in there, you know, they close at 10. If somebody walks in at 9.30 expecting to find a baguette, there needs to be a baguette. Okay. But that means that if that person doesn't walk in then at 10 o'clock when they're closing, you know, you're gonna have bread that needs to be discarded somehow, yes. right? Um, and he says, you know, he puts out bread into the garbage can and even in Tianmu, we think about Tianmu as a very rich place. He says there are still people that comes and picks bread out of his trash can. Okay. Right? So, you know, now via this company, he's selling that bread at a 90% discount. Markdown. Oh, wow. So what he's hoping for is that people that today has to go dumpster diving, hopefully they will be able to afford, um, you know, the 90% off and actually buy it with some more dig dignity and so on. And this company hopes to build up a, an organization, um, like I said, that, you know, then takes the stuff that they can't sell and take it to places where, you know, the really poor can get to it. But anyway, so what makes me excited in any business, it's the concept of people coming together and 
you know, forming a system that solves the problem. You know what I mean? Yes. Like and I guess uh, anyone who would like to seek your uh, funding resource uh, should also think about what you could be contributing to that project as opposed to just getting their money yeah. or your money yeah. and investing in it. Plus, you're also looking into projects that have the good in it. Uh, yeah. So um, one of the news or one of the things that Taiwan wants to be is to become like a hub for innovation in Taiwan. And this specific project that you're funding is one of the innovations, right? And what do you think is lacking in Taiwan in terms of making this dream of becoming the innovation hub of Asia? So this is a also another huge problem, right? I, I, was, I was having a conversation with some people um, some time ago and we were talking about the fact that salaries in Taiwan has been flat for a long time, right? Nearly 20 years or more than 20 years, salaries have basically been flat. And of course, if you adjust for, for inflation, it's actually gone down. So here's the question. How does Taiwanese companies need to change in order to, let's say, see a increase of salaries with 30%, like the average, right? Um, and I think this ties into also with like the bilingual 2030 program. Correct. Right. My opinion is that a lot of Taiwanese people see absolutely no reason why they somehow need to be, you know, bilingual. Right. Because in most companies, there is just not enough work opportunities where you need to use English. Mm, okay. Right. I mean. So if you're looking at a, 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 a typical Taiwanese medium-sized company, 50 to 100 people, you'll have the boss mm -hmm. who drives a very nice car. He yeah. has a really nice house. He plays golf and, you know, he has all the money he needs. Under him, there's a few people that earns okay money. They drive a nice, decent car. And then under them, you have a whole bunch of people that are driving scooters and that's the level they're at, right? Okay, so how would this company needs to change in order to earn more money and, and being able to distribute their earnings more, right? So here's my thinking. The boss needs to start trusting their employees more. And the employees needs to be put in a situation where they can contribute more to the business. So it goes both ways, right? So for example, let's say a designer at one of these companies. Today, let's say most of them don't speak English. Most of them don't actually spend any time looking at what the poten potential international markets are, um, are doing, right? So the boss tells them what to make and they make it with, you know, just what they think is pretty. Mm. All right, so what I'm saying is that the, 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 the government, if they want to achieve their bilingual 2030 goal, they need to encourage companies to start looking outwards a bit more, the whole company, right? Mm -hmm. And by doing that, each more people in the company will be um, contributing more to the profit of the company. They will deserve more money. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So you're asking me, what can Taiwan do to become more of an innovation hub? I think, well, we, it's the, the company needs to be more distributed, right? Today we have in many, many Taiwanese companies where the boss really is, you know, the micromanager, they oversee everything, they, control. you know, they, yeah, they, <laughs> they really want to control everything, right? But, but I do think that that's changing in the younger generation, right? The ones that are part of the, the, the startup community today, I think have a very different attitude to that. I think, I guess so, it's becoming a little bit more uh, flat in the way they communicate with their boss. Uh, they're able to like, you know, present more projects that they think they want. And I guess it's also a generational difference. Uh, even if you look at, you know, startups or um, workers worldwide, wherein the youth are more like outspoken. They have, they can actually ghost you even. <laughs> just, like they just show up like one day and tomorrow they just like, eh, I kind of don't feel like I'm growing personally. Right. Which is not, which is not entirely like a good attitude. But the fact that 
this is an attitude that people can now get hold on to. Bosses are now supposed to like watch out for these these signs that oh maybe this person does not really feel like he can contribute to the company and so I need to make sure this is uh, I have the right environment uh, for him. Yeah, I mean I think when I first got here and I st started looking for for jobs in Taiwan right 21 years ago. Um, I interviewed at some of Taiwan's largest companies mm. and the interviewer would tell me to my face, yeah, we need you here for your English skills for the marketing department, but we don't want your foreign ideas. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> yeah, they would, they, I had several companies that told me that to my face, like literally don't, don't give us your ideas, just come here and you know, write our marketing materials in English and you know, keep your thoughts to yourself. Right, okay. <laughs> And in my opinion, if you are selling things to an international market, you know, take advantage of the international people that you have there, right? Mm -hmm. Like listen to them more. Again, I'm not saying in any way that the foreigner, you know, is better or anything. I, I'm just talking about the understanding of the, the customers that you're selling to, right? Correct. And, and, to t and, and that's, that's the same reason when you know, I've, I've been telling the government, so many different people in the government here that they need to interact with the foreign community more. Why? Because I think we here are the best ambassadors for Taiwan that they could ever have. Exactly. And this is, um, this is the reason why uh, Taiwan has been giving a lot of like scholarships, uh, you know, to, to uh, abroad. Basically, I think this is one of those countries wherein they put like X number of like scholarship grants for, per country. Right. Their main goal is that these foreigners coming into Taiwan would be a good ambassador of knowing what Taiwan is all about. Right. At least that's my understanding. When I came or when I first um, came to Taiwan as a, as a scholar, is to be a good ambassador of telling my country uh, how good Taiwan is as a as a country. Right. But but then so my question then is, so all of these foreigners that come here and up until recently those foreign students, when they graduated, they had to leave, right? They couldn't Many. stay and work here. Now, there are some provisions for why, how somebody who's graduating from a Taiwanese university can stay here, right? But are there enough companies that wants to hire them? I, I remember at least a few years ago, and this is, this is very out of date, but a mm -hmm. few years ago, you know, the government started that Contact Taiwan website, mm -hmm. right? And I had a friend of mine who went through many, 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 like most of their listings or whatever, and, and just looked at them. And he said, 90% of all the listings here are for jobs working for a Taiwanese company in another country, right? Yes. So a, a, a Taiwanese company was looking for somebody that had some education in Taiwan, but please go back and work at our office in another country. You know what I mean? Correct. While those people who graduated here were looking for a way to stay in Taiwan because they like it here. Correct. You know, um, so there was a disconnect there. It's in, you know, again, somehow this thought, I mean, I don't, you, you, I don't know if you've gotten this question. I certainly do. Why are you here? Yeah. Like, why I, are you still here? <laughs> why are you Sweden still here? is a fantastic country. Why don't you go home? Well, I don't get that for my case, okay. the Philippines. They're like, oh, we're glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In my case. I have never been to the Philippines. I, it's a beautiful country. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, a, it's quite challenging right now, but I would still say it's, it's a beautiful country. Um, I think going back to your point, this is also the reason why you have this group called All Hands Taiwan, mm -hmm. right? They try to match jobs of, you know, from the existing pool of foreigners. They try to find... Uh, a good match with companies in right. Taiwan and that, that's actually a proof of what you're saying that um, not many foreign companies would really reach out to, to foreigners that we have here in Taiwan and so a group of you know foreigners came up with something to actually push you the mean foreigner. the local companies are not reaching out yeah to, yeah no I'm so impressed with what all hands have been uh, you know building and yeah, I mean, yeah, that's I what's needed. Yeah, I wanted to guess them here as well, just to get like get a flavor of why they're doing it, what's what's behind it, and I'm sure it's it's also a really good cause. I mean, 
this group of um, individuals are also doing so much good uh, in Taiwan as far as matchmaking of talents right. uh, is concerned. Um, I'm sure we've talked about a lot of like things related to concerns about Taiwan. Could you at least enumerate some good points about Taiwan that has happened over the 20 years that you're here? Well, I mean, first of all, it's a fantastic place to live, it right? Is, yes. You know, um, it's it's nice to live here. It's it's r relatively inexpensive. I mean, you know, you don't need to make an absolute fortune. Like even if you're not making so much money, you can still live well right mm -hmm. here, right? Uh, food is fantastic, you know, which is a, a problem sometimes. Um, you know, people are friendly and all that. Um, like, so, I mean, most foreigners I know who live here, they first and foremost are not coming here to start a business, right? They come here for various reasons, fall in love with living here, and then they at some point come to the conclusion that, you know, I want to start a business, right? Um, now, if, you know, the fact that you can be in the middle of a million people city like Taipei and you are literally only four or five MRT stops away from, you know, great hiking, right? right. The fact that the city is providing um, health centers with gyms, you know, in every area, uh, health care, right? Correct. I mean, honestly, this is, it's hard to beat this place for, you know, life quality in, in so many ways, right? Now, if we're looking at things that have improved, um, well, as a foreigner, right, 20 years ago, you said there's bakeries everywhere. Yes. I'm telling you, when I came here 21 years ago, there was actually two types of bread sold in 7-Eleven. That was it. There was a white toast, and it was the kind that they call apple bread. That was it, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, these days, pretty much any type of food you want from anywhere in the world, you can find it here, right? Correct. You know? Um, so life quality is going up. Of course, transportation is easy. Um, in terms of improvements on legal issues, I mean, there's there so many different types of visas now, right? Correct. I mean, that's the place, I think, where the government has done a lot, right? Okay, the entrepreneur visa had its challenges in the way it was implemented, but it's there and a mm -hmm. lot of people are using it. The gold card, you know, was implemented, I think, much better. Mm -hmm. It seems like they learned uh, some lessons. Um, you know, you have the job seeking visa, right? Yes. So they realize that not everybody who's coming here will already have their career, Designed you know, them, yeah. already set up, right? So I think the government has done a lot to make it easier for people to, to come in. One more question uh, related to this startup industry before we move on to the next part. How do you see Taiwan in the next few years in terms of the startup ecosystem? I think it's going to be great. I mean, we just saw Appier, you know, which is a startup. I think they started in 2009, right? So, you know, they, they are a little bit more than 10 years old and they just went public. Now they went public in Japan, right? But as far as I understand, the founders of Appier is now sitting on a paper wealth of about 300 million US dollars. Wow. Now, will he at some point soon be able to start cashing out and will he come back to Taiwan and start making more investments, right? Yes. Um, so, so, I mean, the startup community is about 10, 11 years old in Taiwan. I, I think now we're gonna start seeing those first generation companies, yeah, going public or being acquired and hopefully we're gonna start getting those founders coming back in and start making more investments. So that's gonna put more money and of course, also more knowledge into the startup community. You know, the Business Next Media, the, the people, you know, behind there who is organizing the Me Taipei event. What a f fantastic event. Correct. With hundreds and hundreds of startups that are having a venue to show themselves off. Nothing like that. I mean, if you go 10 years ago, there was nothing like it, right? So I think that we're going to start seeing more and more, you know, IPOs and exits of these startups. And I think this flywheel of investments and people are going to start speeding up. 
I'm praying for that. I mean, I, I live here. This is already my, my new home. So I'm praying for, for more successful companies. Hopefully someone foreigner, you know, started, will emerge as a unicorn here. I, I'm sure that's going to make the government feel like, okay, we need to put in more. But as early as now, hopefully we could have more of that support that we were talking about earlier. Right. And I mean, and this is also another, I mean, kudos to what you're doing with this uh, uh, YouTube channel and so on. Thank you. Because really, all of this stuff we're complaining about with the banks and <laughs> all of this stuff, the only way, the only way that this is going to change is if Taiwanese people are going to start seeing foreigners as a resource, right? Correct. As, a, as a, a positive impact on the country um, and so on, right? So that's why, you know, the best we can do, you and me and all of us who are participating in this, this community is to highlight the foreigners that are doing well. Correct. Right? And also encourage them to, 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 to take on that limelight, so to speak. Because the older generation, there's, there's a whole bunch, for example, okay, the biggest company started in Taiwan by a for, uh, foreigner has three and a half thousand employees. Wow, that's a lot. Yes. And the man who started that, a Swedish guy, apparently has absolutely no interest in, uh, you know, so to speak, by being up in the front of the foreign community or anything like that. And of course, he can decide exactly. You know, no one needs to be in a position he doesn't want to be. But for example, if we had somebody like that, right, that came to the events and really were like out there and saying, look at me, I'm, I came from another country, I started this company that now has three and a half thousand employees and whatever. I think that would help change the attitude of a lot of people, Correct. Taiwanese people, you know what I mean? Yes. So, so we need to encourage those who are doing well to be at the forefront and people like you and, and Business Next Media and all the other people, you know, media people that are, are covering this area needs to help putting them up there and make sure that local Taiwanese people are seeing what they are achieving. Correct. And I guess it's also, you know, for us to reach out to as many Taiwanese audience as well. This is mm. why from time to time I, I would like to interview some Taiwanese uh, founders on this show just to show that, you know, so that I could at least get some foreigner audience in this uh, platform and eventually, uh, if I can improve on my Chinese, conduct an interview in Chinese so that at least people would feel like, okay, you're really talking to me. Right. Uh, oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> All right, let's go to the last portion of this. Uh, uh, we have this, what we call here as fast round. So basically, I have, all you need to do is just give me quick answers uh, to these questions. Are you ready? Yeah. Uh, what's your daily breakfast? A chicken sandwich. What's, what show are you currently watching on Netflix? I am watching all sorts of Korean dramas. You're the second person to say that. Are you a morning or night person? I am a night person trying to be a morning person. Are you an Android or iOS? I am Android. Oh, okay. Mac or PC? Uh, definitely PC. Favorite games or game if you play games? I haven't, I haven't played anything since I learned Tetris 30 years ago. My whole life is a game. Okay. <laughs> uh, favorite movie of all time? Favorite movie of all time? I have watched Top Gun 36 times, so, so, so maybe at least as a teenager. That counts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let's wrap this up with your action plan. What are we expecting from you and how can we help? You can talk about Inspire, your book, which is, by the way, we will put the buy button, oh, no, buy link in our description and other plans that you may have, uh, you can tell our audience. Um. Well, of course, I hope my business will keep on growing. We're about 50 people now, and I, I think the perfect size for this business would be about 100 people. So okay. I, I hope within maybe one or two years we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I'm actually working on another book. Oh, wow. I would like to target on uh, 
people who are helping foreign companies set up their brands here. So actually oh. going outside of the, the entrepreneur group. Oh, okay. The reason for that is that most of my customers are actually, um, you know, foreign companies. And because, again, there is, because we now have multiple books and more people in this community. Like mm -hmm. when I came out with my book, you know, I, there was the only one and it was a community, you know, task, right? I wanted to get this information out to entrepreneurs. Now we have, you know, more Two people books, working yeah. on it. So my next, my next book will be more focused on people that are actually my customers so I can drive more business. Um, then I'm hoping to get uh, Dragon's Chamber, right, yes. the pitch event, to grow even more. And like I said, I hope to start putting together, um, encouraging more investments into the, the foreign startups. Okay. Um, whether it's my own money or working with other people and, and encourage more of that so that foreigners can grow their business bigger, better, faster, and I hope that that is going to lead to the social changes we've talked about today that may be making it easier for the government to, because a lot of the politicians actually do want to ease the rules for certain things. Correct. But they have their electorate to, to Convince. answer to. Yes. And again, the only reason why they, can, they would be able to make those changes is if they can show look at all these immigrants, what they are doing for Taiwan. Okay. I'm also coming up with a book. I'm just joking. <laughs> and that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you, Elias, mm. for joining us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching the show. Until next time. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys.